Um, and we have, so obviously <laughs> we have a presentation today. Um, Eric is joining us. Um, he's part of University of Colorado's Climate Health Policy Fellowship um, and will be telling us all about that. Um, but um, why don't we, why don't we do introduction so he knows who he's talking to and um, we'll do announcements after that. That sounds okay with everyone. Um, so I'll go first. I'm Gina, I'm the clean program coordinator. Um, I work with Katie um, doing clean stuff and we both work um, in the education and outreach program at uh, Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences at CU Boulder, um, which is based in Boulder, Colorado. I work remotely from Vermont, however. Um, and I will pass it to Hannah next. Uh, hi all, I'm Hannah. I just finished my second year um, at University of Connecticut. I'm doing a PhD in science ed, um, curriculum and instruction. Um, and I'm outside, so my laptop is like on my lap. So I'll probably keep my video off, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I'll pass it to you, uh, Tiffany. Hey everybody. Tiffany Foreman, I'm the School and Public Programs Manager at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research with UCAR, Center for Science Education in Boulder. And I'll pass it to Eric. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, Eric Havel, I'm based in Oakland, California, uh, climate science education. I work for a small nonprofit called the Community uh, Resources for Science. We connect teachers to resources. Uh, and do a lot of professional development um, trainings and, and workshops with teachers specifically, but also do a lot of direct uh, programming with, with students as well. And I will pass it to Katie. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Boyd. I'm the Clean Program Manager, work with Gina on Clean. Um, we're based at Series Education and Outreach, and um, that's in Boulder, Colorado area, the traditional lands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute. I use she, her pronouns. And um, yeah, I do clean and then also research and evaluation on our other projects. So um, I'm happy to be here today. And Eric, I was reading about um, this program a while back, so I'm excited to hear to present about it. And I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm sure you will introduce you for your presentation too, but if you want to just do a quick right here. Do we get everyone in the audience? I'll be happy to in a second. I oh, think. Um, Jim, actually, yeah, good point. Um, Jim, I, I think, are you the last in the folks who are not presenting? You'll be up, Eric, and we'll be up for announcements and the update. Yeah, so I'm Jim Callahan with Mobile, Mobile Climate Science Labs, which is part of climatechangeeducation.org. Um, I'm also the climate education specialist at Lowell School in Washington, DC, and a mentor for Climate Club DC. So, um, well, back to Gina or back to Eric, however it goes. Um, I just wanted to, um, we'll jump into the presentation, but want to give anybody that has announcements um, the opportunity to say so. I just have a, a, quick, a quick two, Gina. Um, uh, sorry, Jim, but you put your virtual hand up. So, <laughs> you, Eric, it, it, I never mind giving the floor over to you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Um, by the way, Eric, I love I love your name. So so nice nice. <laughs> um, two things. One, it's uh, we're going to do that Climate Science Institute. I've been kind of mentioning it for the last couple of weeks. It's August first and second. It's an in person um, uh, workshop for educators in climate science, or climate education writ large. Actually, not just climate science. It'll take place on the UC Berkeley campus for two days, six hours a day. There's a stipend involved um, if you do attend. Um, so I'll put something in the chat about it, a flyer. And then um, we're gonna hold, um, I'm working on a project. Um, my intention is to go to the COP29 conference in Egypt this year in November. And so we're gonna hold an introductory meeting around this uh, next Thursday. So a week from Thursday to talk about this project idea that, that I've been working with some folks on that's basically looking at the Mediterranean climate zones 
around the world and bringing folks together in, in a collaborative kind of an opportunity to, to share stories and best practice and what folks around the world are doing to sort of meet the challenges of climate change, both from a mitigation standpoint and an adaptation standpoint and sort of be solution oriented in the approach and also look really focus on reaching out to diverse audiences and those that are being most impacted um, by the climate crisis. Um, so um, anyway, that's an introductory meeting next Thursday. I'll, next week at CLEAN, I'll have more specifics on the meeting. It'll be 9 a.m. Pacific on uh, Thursday, the 23rd. And I'll, um, it's open to anyone that's interested in just having a conversation and learning about the project um, and, and going to COP29, honestly, too, because I've, I've never been. I attended virtually last year, and it was a great experience. So um, anyway, thanks. Thanks for that. Great. Thanks. So let's see a, a couple. And the second one, I'm going to check if Katie was going to announce this one, then I'll hold off if that's the case. Um, just in general, for folks to know, uh, uh, several things all come are able to happen now that public events are coming back, that they're coming back, but being COVID safe, generally outside, people wearing masks. I mean, there's always a risk, right? It's not probably, probably safe, but um, some of it is it allows much of the African-American climate education specialists who, who function in the United States to be doing what they're experienced in doing, which is doing hands-on science, bringing science to the public, to African-American communities. That's where most many, uh, let's see, a large percentage of the African-American climate education specialists are. And so when we have our events coming back, they're able to get out among with the public again. So that's a very good thing. At these events, this is also a chance, Eric, uh, well, both Eric's are on this one, but at these events are often the medical community. So for instance, in our area, it's Kaiser Permanente. Um, we'll have uh, exhibit uh, booths and things often right next to us. So there's a question of bringing up climate change. It's, a, it does, it's something they do deal with. And many of the events are also hosted by the University of California, San Francisco, that particular campus. Um, I, I'll look for your reaction on this, Eric, being in a different part of the country, Colorado. UCSF, UC San Francisco is among the top 20, I don't know, top 10 medical training uh, universities in the, in the country. So that they take climate change very important and getting out to the public is important. And then also finally for Katie and Gina, thanks to your help, we now always have a clean banner and we have a clean postcard. So they're represented at these events. Um, they're, they're just coming back um, all during the summer. And, 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 and for, for instance, one of the first ones will be, is organized specifically for the African-American community in the Civic Center of San Francisco, bringing in about 500 African-American kids from around the area to do climate education and, uh, and STEM education. So the other one, uh, Katie, I'm gonna look for your reaction here, because if I'm about to announce what you have, I will stop. But after this call at 11, 11 o'clock, California time is uh, a NOAA webinar. Is that okay? I saw that it's on my calendar, but I was not going to announce that. Okay. Is it okay? Is it, it? There's no reason not to announce it, right? Yeah. Okay. So Dr. Higgins, who is important in in the direction of NOAA, is giving a, a presentation that let's see if I can get the title right. Where is the title? NOAA. And she said, "Now here, I have not managed my window very well." but uh, NOAA's role in the whole of government effort to address climate change. So that's at 11. And um, I think you can, it, it's not a problem to still get an invitation to it and the thing. It's on a, an Adobe platform, but um, uh, which is new for me, but I, I did try the link they sent and it let me in. So I mean, but uh, so, I mean, if people still wanna go, uh, it's to get a thing, um, a uh, invitation to it. If I get a couple nods from people, I'll go ahead and put that link in, in there, how to get in still if you want to be. Does that sound okay? All right. So thank you for the time on that one. Uh, uh, we'll see where the NOAA from the top is planning to go. So, thanks. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, I saw that webinar. I was interested in it. It's on my calendar, so I'll try to attend too. Um, no, I was actually going to announce the um, two clean review camps that we did this year are done in the books. We had our second one yesterday, so that's exciting. Um, and uh, we ended up out of 105 resources that we looked at for the clean collection. Um, let's see, in the first camp, 
we passed 35, failed 15, and three were sent to the editorial board. And this most recent one, we passed 31, failed 16, and it looks like four were sent to the editorial board. And then there's one, I'm not sure what happened to it. Um, it hasn't been, I'm gonna reach out to the person who's in charge of that one because they didn't put an outcome on it yet. So um, pretty good overall, good, um, good rates coming out of the clean review camps this year, pretty similar to, to most years. So we're gonna be getting, what's that, about 70-ish um, new resources into the collection. So just exciting stuff on the clean education resource side of things. So just thought I'd keep you all posted on that. Thank you, Katie. Very excited about that. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> um, I this just reminded me too that I also have an announcement that's related to Clean. Um, we have if you're subscribed to the Clean newsletter, that's fantastic. We are kind of revamping the newsletter a little bit, as you may have noticed. We send out clean resources in our newsletter typically, but I believe that there's a lot of other fantastic stuff that Clean does that um, doesn't often get featured in the newsletter, like this presentation. So we're actually creating a separate newsletter um, for the Clean Network, and I encourage everyone to subscribe to it. Um, I'll put the link, there's a link in the chat. Um, so you can sign up when you open the link, it's all the series you know, projects, but sign up for the Clean Network newsletter um, and that will have more information pertinent to the Clean Network rather um, than just classroom teachers, which is great, but um, a different audience. Uh, so feel free to share and I'll be sending out a few announcements on the listserv about that, but we're very excited to have a new newsletter. Um, anything else from folks? Thanks for all the info in the chat about the presentation. Any announcements from you, Wendy? No, all set, okay. Um, awesome, well, without further ado, I will let Eric go ahead and share his screen and introduce himself. Okay, all right, everyone. Thank you so much, by the way, Gina, for um, keeping me on track and bringing me in today. I really appreciate it. And before I get too deep into this, I need to do the obligatory mic and screen check. Are people hearing and seeing me okay? Everything looks and sounds great. Okay, fantastic. All right, guys. Um, again, thank you so much for having me uh, come by and chat with you today. Um, your time is precious, and I'd like to um, hopefully chat about some stuff that I think is of mutual interest to us in our respective organizations missions. Um, I had the good fortune of meeting uh, Dr. Ann Gold uh, at the most recent AGU conference in December. Uh, she pulled me inside and said, hey, we're, we're kind of doing similar things and we're coming at it from different angles, but we should really make sure that uh, it, people know that each other exists and maybe there are opportunities that will come out of this in the future, whatever they may be for collaboration, partnerships, or, or even just to learn something from each other. To uh, give you a little bit of uh, background, my name again is Eric Balaban. Um, I am a practicing physician uh, in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for UPMC. Um, and simultaneously, I've been completing a one-year fellowship, which uh, will make up the backbone of what we'll actually talk about today. This fellowship is called the Climate Change and Health Science Policy Fellowship. It was founded in 2017, so it's still a pretty young program. And that's going to reflect itself when we talk about the structure of this program, because it's still kind of nascent. It's still taking shape. Um, However, it has a pretty well-defined mission, and um, I, I'm happy to be graduating with the um, experience that this fellowship's afforded me even this week. So I'm actually in Denver, Colorado, coming at you live, um, preparing for that. So to get into it, let's see, there we go. Um, as we mentioned, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to talk about the multiple problems that uh, this fellowship seeks to ameliorate. We're gonna talk about the doctor's role uh, in forming a solution to some of the challenges that climate change poses um, to public health and beyond. 
And uh, we're also going to talk about the myriad of solutions that hopefully this fellowship, this educational innovation within the medical sector is servicing. Uh, and we're going to talk about what exactly the fellowship is, what it's hopefully its mission is, the educational approach of this fellowship, because I know that that is of specific interest to several members in the audience today. Um, and some of the cool things that have come out of this fellowship so far and the trajectory that we're taking. Um, and, you know, to start on the ground floor, um, the problem at its core, of course, is climate change. And fortunately, this is not a group where I need to allot a, a large amount of time describing this problem, too. I think we all understand climate change. I think we all understand the woes associated with it. Of course, um, put simply by someone who's not an environmental uh, scientist, of course, rising levels of carbon dioxide causing um, a, a unsafe and unprecedented spike in average global temperatures. So um, what, what is kind of more interesting to a doctor um, is really uh, the, the impact that that has on health, public health, your patient's health. We'll use the term climate health just to kind of capture the, the, the spirit of that association. There are a myriad ways that uh, a patient's health is impacted negatively by climate change. Um, the WHO actually came out uh, recently and stated that climate change is the biggest health threat facing humanity this century. That's verbatim from the WHO. And during COP26, uh, just last November, which I was fortunate enough to, to go to, and I'm so excited for any of you who can make it to the next COP, it is really uh, especially if you can get restricted zone tickets, that is really a special uh, experience. But the New York Times published an article really casting light on the fact that efforts are being mobilized to reframe climate change, which frankly has never been uh, a particularly palatable topic or interesting, and really unfortunately has become badly politicized and, and bruised. But reframing that as a, a health crisis and how that this is gaining more traction. And it's not an inappropriate framework to understand climate change either, because uh, as we'll talk about, whether it is a direct effect or an indirect effect of climate change, uh, there are so many ways that climate change is and will put patients in the hospital. And so whether you decide to take a proactive approach uh, or a reactive approach, within the medical sector, this does become our problem at some point. Uh, to walk through some of the um, instances that uh, this becomes a health relevant issue, some of these are obvious, some of these I think are, are less obvious, but obviously heat is something that is uh, quite a big problem whenever it becomes too much. As temperatures increase, as heat wave frequency increases, this invokes something that we call heat related illness, which can be everything from dehydration, uh, chronic low degree of heat can cause chronic kidney disease, and of course, heat stroke, portending about a 30 to 40% chance of mortality in some cases, if not irreversible neurological damage, um, which have obviously is health relevant. Something that I learned uh, and didn't appreciate was that uh, rising temperatures catalyze the creation of ozone and smog, um, and this combined with higher levels of particulate pollution from burning wildfires, loosening topsoil from droughts, uh, makes, a, uh, ma makes for worse air to breathe. And in fact, uh, Eric, did you mention that you're from Oakland? Yeah, so, so, so there was, uh, I, you know, I work with the Envi Environmental Defense Fund on a, a number of things. They've done some really interesting studies in Oakland, actually, which have found that um, areas of the city that have particularly high heat have particularly bad air to breathe, urban heat islands pretending worse air quality. And the so what, whenever we bring up doctors, is the fact that people from those areas that breathe worse air have about an eightfold increase of suffering a stroke or heart attack, portending a similar risk of smoking a pack of tobacco a day, which is certainly something that medicine takes under its wing. Um, the, the different shifts uh, in the environment, of course, bring about higher degrees of hurricanes, storms, flooding, tornadoes, invoking trauma, and disruption to uh, the system. Uh, obviously, if someone gets hurt, they come to the hospital and becomes a medical issue. 
Uh, and I also reflect on um, an experience in my medical training when I was a med student at Hershey. Uh, that was Hurricane that was Hurricane Maria uh, had had devastated Puerto Rico, if I'm not mistaken. I may be my hurricanes mixed up, but Puerto Rico had been devastated by a hurricane. Again, I think that was Maria. And uh, believe it or not, Puerto Rico produces a huge amount of the country's supply of a medicine called normal saline, which we treat everything from trauma to headaches. Uh, <laughs> take normal saline. And in Hershey, Pennsylvania, we were rationing and running out of the most basic medicine available uh, because one of the manufacturers in Puerto Rico had been devastated by a storm. And so really, as robust as our system is, it is extremely fragile to events like this. Drought we mentioned uh, will uh, worsen everything from air quality to food availability. Um, and vector-borne disease uh, will change as well. Uh, with mosquitoes, we worry about Nest West Nile virus. Uh, we worry about malaria um, and uh, another, oh, Zika virus as well is, is becoming a, a bigger issue as well. Uh, living in Pennsylvania, ticks are always a topic of concern. Um, over the past 10 years or so, there's been about a fourfold increase in the incidence of Lyme disease because the winters are milder, the ticks are surviving, tick season is longer, and people are getting Lyme disease more frequently. Uh, and so the patterns of tick-borne diseases in many cases are, are, are worsening or at least changing. There are harmful algae blooms affecting sea life, uh, affecting patient health as a uh, result, vibrio infections causing loss of limb and uh, life. Uh, all of this, all of these pressures create immigration pressures. And this is something that while it feels second and third degree, again, all these patients um, end up in a hospital at some point. And so it depends on how preventative you wanna be with your preventative medicine definition. But uh, you know, uh, in America particularly, you, you look at the dry corridor, which is a, a region of Central America, uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, um, and uh, you see that there's been about a 90% decrease in their food yield due to climate change over the past decade. This has uh, put about 4 million people uh, in, in harm's way and has been responsible for millions of people emigrating. Uh, projections, uh, depending on the model you look like, worry about up to 30 million people emigrating from Central America northwards towards America the, um, over the next 30 years as a result of climate change and food scarcity therein. Uh, the, the World Bank actually issued an expectation in 2018 that was a little more mild, but suggested only 17 million people would be knocking on the southern border of the United States. When that happens, this will strain medical resources. This is going to pose medical challenges as we resume care for these patients. Um, and, and um, it, you know, it's, it, it's important to, to consider the uh, systems level impacts that this has as a whole and the conflict, by the way, that ensues from all this. Um, mental health is something that's becoming more and more recognized as a sequelae of a climate change. Um, after this slide, uh, maybe your risk for depression and anxiety has increased five or 10%, who knows, but people are getting mental illness more frequently. And unfortunately they are a vulnerable population as are underrepresented groups, the BIPOC community and beyond uh, suffer uh, more frequently. They're less climate resilient because they are more poorly resourced, unfortunately and don't get the um, reactive or proactive attention they need to meet the health challenges that are exacted in greater proportion in that community. So we look at medicine. What is, how is medicine responding to this? And unfortunately, medicine is actually contributing to the problem. And, and the, uh, th this is something that you can either lead by example or at least try to respond to the problem. Unfortunately, um, it, it appears that the U.S. healthcare carbon footprint actually makes up uh, anywhere from 8.5 to 10 percent of the carbon footprint um, of America. And so a tenth of the problem uh, emanated from America is actually in our own backyard. Worldwide, um, it's a little less, but we're still looking at about 5 percent of all uh, global emissions come from, um, come from uh, the... Uh, 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 the healthcare sector. And when, you know, we all know the phrase do no harm, 
it is insidious, but it is true that by contributing to the carbon footprint, you are playing a role in the exacerbation of all of the badness that we just talked about on this slide. Uh, on, and and what, I, what I would say is adding salt to injury, uh, doctors and nurses are elements, uh, are, are, are participants that could be, um, could be really powerful leaders in the space to create change. This is the Global Trustworthiness Index from 2021. Doctors are ranked at the top. That's usually consistently the case. Depending on the survey or study you look at, nurses and doctors rank pretty high, usually in the top two or three of messengers when it comes to uh, the public um, looking for advice. Um, I'm interested to see how COVID may or may not change those statistics, but it is to say that um, we, we not only have an obligation to respond to this problem, but we also have a huge opportunity to do so. Um, what, 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 what is shameful is there is no structured education on this. There is no path forward. Uh, physicians are unarmed to meet this challenge, um, which is, I think, just a, a, a colossal grievance. And this is really the frontier that we are trying to pioneer with this fellowship. So if we look at what needs to happen for a doctor to become an effective climate clinician, we'll call them, a doctor who acknowledges and adopts clinical practice, acknowledging the threat of climate change, you need a physician who first acknowledges climate change. And then they have to acknowledge that that climate change has an impact on health. And then they need to say, well, this is a big enough problem that we should change the way that we conduct business in the clinic. Um, and then uh, only, only after that can they go out and change the culture. And I think a lot of people in the room today are educators, are people who are current, constantly bumping up against this idea of culture and trying to create a bedrock change in what we understand about the world uh, around us. There have been several studies to quantify which link in this chain is the weakest link. Uh, specifically on, on my chart, or, or excuse me, on my scholarly review, there are of note three domestic surveys of physicians um, and one international survey of, of, of physicians conducted by Ed Maybach and um, um, Monica Sarfe. And, and, and they, they, they are pretty consistent in suggesting that the first link is pretty intact. Physicians understand climate change to be real. That's a good place to start, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, a surprising number also acknowledged the relevance for patient care. Um, and there's a little more variation in this. Usually about two thirds or more say, yeah, this is hurting our patient population and we should do something about it. The NMA, the um, National Medical Association, which was one of the three domestic surveys, 99% of those physicians said there needs to be a public health intervention in response to this climate crisis. So it seems clear that, um, that physicians generally, at least the ones who answer surveys, acknowledge climate change as a health relevant issue. The breakdown, however, seems to be taking that understanding and bringing the change into clinical practice. What does it mean to acknowledge these threats? How do we, how do we translate that into the, the guy or gal walking in in a white coat to sit down with you and talk about your blood pressure? Where, where, where exactly do we fit in? Um, and that's, that's a good question. There are a bunch of barriers, everything from um, time uh, to just lack of understanding of the extent that climate has on health. And uh, also just the, the, the lack of training on how, how do you phrase these things, particularly in such a politically charged climate? Um, what, what is an effective way to broach this with a patient, even though it's relevant? So that right there is, exact, is, is, is where I think the highest yield uh, is to correct a limiting reagent in producing climate-informed clinicians. Uh, fell, and, and that's frankly where the fellowship comes in. Um, the roadmap to become a fully trained physician is as follows, uh, because I, I've been in this sector long enough that I realize that this, is, this may be a mystery to people who um, haven't walked the, the path himself. But from college being four years, <clears throat> typically uh, folks go on to med school, which is four years, and then residency. And depending on what residency you choose, uh, that will take between three and six years. 
After you're done with residency, you are a minted doctor um, and you have the option to go on to a fellowship to be subspecialized in some area. This is where surgeons become neurosurgeons. This is where internal medicine doctors such as myself go on to be lung doctors or kidney doctors or heart doctors, specialists. And depending on the organ system you focus on, that's between an additional one to four years of training. Uh, and that is where we focus our attention in this fellowship. This is, a, this is a one year program after residency that trains clinical physicians, anyone who touches a patient on um, everything that really we just talked about. And we, we, we equip them with the tools that they need to try to do something about it. So the big ideas of this fellowship really uh, questions that we still ask ourselves every day is how, how does climate change impact human health? How do we know that? How can we prove that? Have we gotten an exhaustive idea of what all that looks like? And that, that, that is an active area of research. Then we ask ourselves, how can we as physicians, what can we do to enact change in the large and small levels? What kind of clinical or medical system changes can or should happen? A lot of this comes down to communication. A lot of this comes down to framework, messaging, uh, written, spoken, um, and unspoken communication. How do you do that effectively? And we turn to, uh, we turn to other people to let us know how to do that. Cause a lot of this invokes social psychology, behavioral psychology. Um, and we, we, we sit down with folks like Catherine Hayhoe, which, um, may, may or may not be a familiar name, but she's, she's taken the time to chat with us, uh, on a few different occasions on, uh, how to communicate these difficult scientific ideas. And then of course, how do you go forward and use those communication strategies to teach patients and your colleagues to reach that holy grail of a cultural transformation? So the way I see our fellowship working, there are two arms. Uh, the first one is a didactics. This is where uh, me having been taught nothing but medicine, uh, pills, physical maneuvers, physical exams, whatever else, my entire life, this is where I stumble out of residency and say, what else do I need to know uh, to be able to function in a world that isn't just medicine? Because uh, again, your training is very specific all through this, uh, all, all through the journey to become a physician. And so some things that we're taught is how to write an op-ed, uh, how to do public speaking, uh, give presentations. We have book clubs. Um, uh, some book clubs. Again, we, we read Catherine Hayhoe's book, discussed it with her. Uh, Ministry for the Future was another um, a common uh, book that, that we read and sit down with the authors. Uh, we go to conferences um, and try to spread the message, display our research. We've gone to, over, over the course of the past year, we've gone to um, uh, Society of Internal Medicine. We've gone to uh, the uh, American Geophysical uh, Union, the, the AGU conference. We've gone to Clean Med, a number of other conferences, including COP26 again, which, is, um, which, which, which was just a, a, a wonderful event. Um, we have routine discussions with experts. Uh, and again, I think many people in the room would, would uh, comfortably and appropriately couch themselves as a relevant expert in the field. Um, of course, there are assigned readings and lectures that we attend, and something that we're actually adding this next year is formal media training. This is something that became a little more relevant with COVID-19, as you see physicians and healthcare professionals, public health officials being sat down in front of a camera, a bright light, and maybe a less than sympathetic interviewer. And even with the best intentions and all the knowledge, if you don't frame your message well, you end up shooting yourself in the foot. And so formal media training is something else that uh, is becoming more of the uh, part of the core curriculum. The second arm of our, the second of two arms of our fellowship is really the experiential components. This is where you go out and you, um, you work with people who are already doing stuff. And it's a two-way reciprocal relationship when you're in these partnerships. Uh, you both contribute to their mission and you also see how the sausage is made from their perspective. Each fellow is assigned to both an NGO and a federal program for the whole year. For example, uh, over the past year, I've worked with David Herring uh, within NOAA um, and in close partnership with the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. Um, my uh, NGO partnership has been with the Environmental Defense Fund. 
Um, and of course, uh, my four co-fellows have their respective NGO and federal partnerships as well. And uh, each one of these collaborations, again, mutually beneficial, as I mentioned, as you contribute to their mission, they, they love having uh, a clinically trained practicing physician show up and be able to give a scientific, but also an organic perspective to the problems that they're already trying to address. And uh, you get to see exactly what is an NGO. How do federal organ organizations play with each other? What are the barriers? What are the strengths, et cetera? And this list is growing all the time. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a messy slide, but uh, this year alone, there are three new federal partners, one of which being FEMA. Um, and and uh, it's, it, it's exciting to see over the really three short years, uh, how much interest uh, this kind of collaboration has garnered. Some of the results uh, that we've seen come out of the fellowship have been extremely encouraging. As I mentioned, this, this was founded in 2017 um, by uh, an ED physician, Jay Lemery. Uh, within emergency medicine, there's actually a specific medicine called environmental medicine uh, or wilderness medicine. And Dr. Lemery in the uh, top right picture standing up there, he was kind of the first person to say, well, if we're doing wilderness medicine, it kind of feels natural that emergency medicine physicians should also be worried about climate and its effects on health. And he sponsored this fellowship. We had one fellow for the first couple of years. Uh, this year was actually the first year that we had more than one, and we had five. Um, and five is fewer than the number of applicants. It, it was a challenge to secure one of these positions. And every year um, we are expanding in focus and in number um, of uh, physicians who are wanting to get involved. And these are physicians straight out of residency, like myself. Um, and you know, I, I've interviewed candidates for the next year who are everyone from physicians in um, Argentina and Saudi Arabia who are interested in, in, in being part of this. Um, as, as well as public health officials who unfortunately didn't meet the criteria in, in, in Texas, all around the nation from all walks of life. People, people are seeing this appropriately as a lightning rod to rally around and try to see how do we teach doctors who know this is a problem? How, how do we teach them to, to, to tackle these challenges? There have been academic and networking conferences in, in Hollywood and at uh, you know, uh, medical conferences uh, we've given TED Talks. There have been scholarly publications. I'm in the process of drafting a manuscript uh, as we speak as well. Um, the research that we do is both domestic and international. Um, Dr. Sorensen in the middle picture there uh, traveled to Central America to see how heat is impacting chronic kidney disease of field workers, for example. Um, we uh, routinely give lectures to medical students, colleagues, grand rounds, Whoever really will lend, a, lend an ear, we're interested in, in creating those microcultural changes. Um, uh, a public interest area of mine is public and uh, medical policy action. Um, after learning some of the tools of the trade, I was able to get myself situated, for example, as the advisor for Josh Shapiro, who's running for governor of Pennsylvania this year, to serve as his climate and health advisor and have uh, successfully written uh, papers and sat in meetings to advise what the threats are and what the best framing of those threats would be. Um, and within medical societies, like Pennsylvania medical societies, we're forming task forces and things to recognize this as an issue. As, we, as I mentioned, this is an expanding program and it has even given rise to other educational programs. Uh, there's actually a sister fellowship that has sprung up in, um, uh, 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 in Harvard, um, where uh, a past fellow has gone forth and um, uh, another emergency medicine physician has started a similar fellowship in uh, a place across the country. And last but not least, when we look towards the future, uh, what the next steps are. Some things that I recognize about this program is that it is flexible, it's adaptable, and it's growing. We are always seeking collaborators in, in many respects, one of which being research. Um, many of the fellows who come in are rosy-eyed, but really don't, and, and this was me, you know, 11 months ago, really didn't know where to start. And it's not clear that 
we have all the answers. I mean, we are really pioneering in uh, an innovative and um, a first attempt at a, a framework or structure to teach this sort of stuff. And so we need partners to tell us what we're missing or what we could do better. Um, and so whether that's within networking, in uh, guest speakers for education, whether people are interested in having interns uh, from our uh, fellowship to participate in their programs, or if, it are, if it's people who think that uh, the, you know, uh, having a doctor to comment on these issues um, in a constructive way would be interesting or beneficial for their community or a community that they're aware of. Um, you know, th those are all things that we're interested in. And as you can tell, uh, there are many points of overlap in the areas of interest or relevance. And this is everything from communication to education, even conflict resolution, um, and applies everything private to public and sector. Uh, we're interested in spreading the message. And really, if there is anything uh, health related that, that folks are interested in knowing more about, exploring together, those, those are all things that we're well situated to assist in and, uh, and, and take part in. So with that, again, I really appreciate your time. Um, I know that was 20 to 30 consecutive minutes of me beating you upside the head with this uh, uh, idea of a fellowship, but um, th that's my email uh, and Dr. Lemery, who again is the fellowship director at the bottom there. And of course, I wanted to preserve time at the end in case there were uh, pointed questions or comments that I could help clear up before I uh, take off. That was awesome. Thank you, Eric. Um, super great to have your perspectives and I have to give a shout out the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. I did my graduate assistantship with them when I was at George Mason, a great organization. Um, and I think this work is super important. So it's great that you're here talking about it. Um, Jim, I see that you have your hand raised. Yes. Hi, sorry, we're, why my video is not on. Come on, video. Um, Eric, so, so fantastic. This is, uh, I, I would also say that, that our, my experience for the education community, uh, perhaps the most, most uh, enthusiastic of the professions that have connected with us is the medical profession. I mean, I, I, that I've seen just over and over again, very organized and very, you know, it's really an outstanding uh, work that goes on, right? Um, I think maybe to go to it, where I want to say is that um, on the on looking for pl uh, places where doctors, medical professionals could speak or uh, bring a message out, right? Um, so rather than say this is what you should do, I want to run something by you quickly here to see sure. if this is, okay. yes, please. That, that uh, doctors, medical professionals, when they say their message, that into the answer of like, well, so what as a community can we do? Or what can people do, right? We can do things as doctors, we can do things in our profession, we can do that, and that's important. But a community do, is it ever that there's more that we can do as a community than speak to elected uh, officials and lobby, okay? That's always the number one thing that what you can do. The second one is you can recycle cans, right? I mean, it's basically, you can do lobbying and you can do personal stuff. But what I what I kind of want to say what I want to say is the thing of are there is not the community just moving ahead and doing things we're making things happen as the community we're not doing everything dependent on having the political system get behind everything until it moves we don't do anything as a community and I want to bring that up just and I'll finish here in a second is I think it's important especially for medical professionals to do it because there are certain professions who take action. When someone is hurt, they don't go and ask a politician, do I treat this person? If there's a new disease, they don't say, well, should we develop a vaccine? You get on it, you do it. You find a problem and you do it. I, my training is an engineer. That's another profession where we solve problems. We create problems. We do bad things sometimes, but, but we're problem solvers. We don't go around waiting for someone to tell us things. And I think we need professions that say that to the public. Let's work together to do things, and especially on climate change, because what happens is you've got big industries that have gotten in the way. You have political parties that are doing everything to make it as we control Congress, and nothing's going to happen until you get us to do things, and people just get bummed out and don't feel anything. 
So I'm running it by you. Is that a message that your doctors could ever say, we're doing things, let's work with other professionals in other areas. Let's go out and do stuff. You know, yeah, Jim, you, you, you touched on a lot of, uh, I think very salient points. And by the way, I, I, my, my undergrad was in biomedical engineering. So, so you, you and I think have a similar framework in defining a problem and, and trying to get a path forward to a result. I, um, I, I'll say that we recognize the value um, the potential in mobilizing the healthcare sector, particularly physicians in, in exactly the way you mentioned, because um, there are just so many ways to create change. And um, I think this has been a big area that I have uh, done learning in the past year myself. And, you know, a lot of us see the political organization as the engine that creates change. And I, you know, I have to be honest, it's less clear to me, is it, you know, does the macro political level, does that respond to culture and, and, and how people are acting, what we believe, or does it force uh, a belief system or culture on people? It's not clear to me, and, and there's probably back and forth both ways, it's not clear to me exactly what the balance there is, but it does lend credence to the importance of getting involved in every possible way. Cause it's not, it, it's not clear to me which one's more valuable, but both are valuable. Whether it is the physician diffusing this topic as something that isn't Democrat or Republican, it is a health crisis. It is, it is me coming to you, not, uh, not thinking about X, Y, Z on a partisanship platform, but saying, I, I don't want your lungs to fail. I, I don't want you to have a heart attack and I want you to have food that's good for you. And this is why I'm bringing it up. Um, that, that reframing, um, I think, you know, patient by patient, doctor by doctor, um, and you're speaking to an optimist as, as, as you may have gathered, but that moves the needle on us understanding the problem and being able to diffuse it, quite frankly. At the same time, even though we see so much uh, stalemate and uh, deadlock in the macro system. One point that we emphasize to physicians is um, the fact that they tend to have uh, a special ear within that system. And we talk about the ideas of, hey, how do you adopt a congressperson? How do you adopt a senator? How do you make yourself relevant and get in touch with these people such that, you know, I mean, hey, you can run for office if you want to, but what even may be more valuable is finding the person who's run for office and being their advisor and, and getting involved in that way, or whether it's organized medicine. There, there, there are many ways to create change, but we do our best to, um, to touch on each one of those levels and conduits of involvement. There are so many different ways to do this, by the way that we tend to leave fellows to build their own adventure. There's very little structure beyond um, prioritizing which partnership with your NGO or federal organization you want and the core didactic curriculum, which really is only carved out about half the year. This latter half of the year is, again, we, we choose lecturers and customize things. There's a lot of flexibility in doing what you want to do because there's just, there's too much for, for five fellows to try to um, become experts in, in, in a one-year course. That's it. That, that was a bit of a ramble, Jim, but did I, uh, address some of the core points of what you asked? Cool. Perfect. That was a very thoughtful response. Thank you, Eric. Katie, you see the hand raised. Yeah, I, w I was curious about the training aspect of this. So um, you mentioned that, you know, doctors will often do the fellowships to kind of become more specialized. And this seems like it's really specializing within that, like, public health, you know, um, communication aspect of climate, um, climate change, which is so important, right? We all work on, you know, climate communications, and, and that's a big part of what we're doing. And it's nice to see the doctors, um, some doctors getting involved with that and interested in that. And I, I love the idea for the fellowship, but I was just curious then how that works. If somebody did, you said sort of one to four years, depending on the specialization, you know, is this something somebody could do on top of another specialization? Could they specialize or does it tend to be something that they just go this route, 
what you know um, I'm just curious kind of like what the training is is it something that somebody already specialized in something and then like two years after that fellowship they could do try to do this you know like when in their career are they always doing this right afterwards uh, right after the residency is it something they could go back to after doing more you know specialization for a while I was just curious kind of like how that works within the normal framework of specialization for the doctors yeah, Katie, that's that that's a good question in part because um, there are a few different combinations of answers. I think I think at its core, um, the one point is that these can stack. Um, the 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 extra trainings can stack, but they typically don't happen in parallel. And so, um, for example, uh, just as, again, just as an example. I went to residency, University of Colorado for internal medicine, and then I'm doing this one year fellowship. And it is, uh, in my case, been customized uh, almost as like a part time fellowship. Uh, so I can do some clinical work and, and work as a hospice as well. So you can work a part time job while doing this fellowship um, and, and get away with it with a very constructive experience. However, after this one year, I am interested in. Um, uh, in pulmonary and critical care medicine. And so uh, one of my ambitions in the next year or two is to, when this is done, apply to a pulmonary and critical care fellowship as well. So you can have multiple fellowships, um, but uh, it, is, it is impossible to do anything uh, more than one medical fellowship at one time, just given the demands it tends to have on the, the pupil. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for answering that question. So it does sound though like you can still do clinical work on top of this. And um, mm. and you said that there was multiple people who applied for this. How did they find out about it? Like, is it something that um, you try to advertise pretty widely or is it still, since it's such a small, you said there's not you know a lot of opportunities yet, you're trying to expand it. Is it something yeah. that you kind of just word of mouth or like, yeah, how do people get interested in this? <laughs> That's, that's, that is a great question. I don't know if I even have a, a fair answer there. I, I, I do want to say that um, being a practicing clinician is actually requisite. And so they expect you to be seeing patients during this experience, because what makes us valuable or unique as messengers is the fact that we have that experience. And so you, you want to try to find a way to dovetail that with your clinical uh, responsibilities and not make it um, ex um, mutually exclusive. Uh, by way of circulating the awareness of this fellowship, <laughs> um, Google, I think is big. I, 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 that that kind of strikes at the question of how, how does one network? Like, how did you find these people? How did you get this survey out? And um, I think a lot of this just comes down to making yourself visible, trying to um, broadcast as well as possible, which is why when Gina and Dr. Gold said, hey, come by and chat with us, uh, that was a very easy question for me to do because we, we love spreading the idea of this fellowship. The fellows go on, chat about it. We talk about it with colleagues. It is Googleable. You, you can search this. We have a web page. We're tied with the University of Colorado um, you know, School of Medicine. Uh, so it is, it is not hidden. It is a weird fellowship, uh, but hopefully anything from a Google search to word of mouth is, is how the message is still disseminating. I, I hope to tap the organized medicine too, uh, like the medical societies. That's, that's one way to find a group of doctors who have a second to actually listen to what someone wants to say. So um, there's no central, there's no like doctor chat room yet. So we're doing it the old fashioned way. That's fair. It sounds like it's still a new program. So you're trying to figure out how to get the word out and stuff. That's fair. Um, Eric Havel, I see that you have your hand raised. Thanks, Gina. And thanks, Eric, for a great presentation. I'm curious about, you know, sort of on the, the book endings, thinking about the sort of undergraduate experience and maybe your own pathway into this space where you got interested in this, this fellowship after residency. And I know for me, like I did a lot of community work in college and I got out into Oakland, Oakland communities and learned about the different communities and which ones are being more impacted by environmental issues, for example, like the one you presented about air quality, which is very real for Oakland uh, 
parts of Oakland specifically. Um, and if there was anything that you would recommend or even share about your own story in terms of the undergrad experience, because I, I know the, the thing about pre-meds, you know, when you're in, when you're in these, these science classes is the pre-meds are there to get chemistry and physics done and they're serious and they're going to town and they're very focused. And then you had folks maybe more like me that are sort of interdisciplinary and, and sort of gathering the basic understandings of the sciences to integrate towards environmental solutions was sort of my, my take on it. And I didn't exactly know the path I was on. Um, so just, but we, we share a common goal, you know, in terms of really wanting to understand the sciences and have that as a base to then utilize that in our given sort of profession. But one is kind of going fo focus, the other is maybe going broad. Um, so just curious about your own perspective on that, or if there was, were things in your undergrad experience that might've helped you kind of frame your direction now? We'll say uh, college, university, uh, categorizing undergrad, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is this is steering attention towards you know very appropriately. How do we how do we actuate or how do we leverage other conduits of education to get active in this space besides just physicians who have gone to school for thirty years? There are so many other learners that in and outside of medicine uh, should have at least some awareness of of what's happening. I, I don't know if I can speak very intelligibly as to um, what primary, secondary, tertiary schools can or should do. I'm just not familiar with that curricular or, or curricular development. I'll say that, as you know, I, I, I studied engineering um, at, at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania for my undergrad. Um, and just like you said, I mean, hey, we talked about biology, chemistry, if carbon came up, it was asking me about how it chelates, you know, octane or whatever else. Like it, it, it wasn't, um, it was not environmental. You could study environmental stuff, but that was certainly elective. Um, I don't know how to approach the core competencies to change that. I am a little more familiar with the medical education and something that um, I, I'm particularly interested in is saying, hey, this, this idea of, um, climate change causing a health crisis is relevant enough that it needs to, that, that core competencies in medical school, uh, they, they don't need to beat med students over the head of this, but really there is no awareness of any of this uh, amongst the medical sector. And of course that's hyperbolic, but um, I, I and my colleagues do not have an appreciation for everything I just talked about, unless you sit down and hear about it. And it's almost like, how do we miss this? I think there's a huge missed opportunity in medical school uh, education, particularly with the health relevant components. Um, I would have to think more on how we, um, how we bring that to a, a, a non-medical education platform. I'm sure the answer's out there, but I, I I'd be wasting your time uh, trying to uh, trying to issue an answer now. I just haven't come up with a good solution. Great, Eric. Those are all um, really helpful thoughts, and um, I know it's it's twelve oh two Mountain, so um, I don't want to take more of everyone's time, um, but you know. Eric's email is there. So, um, you know, he said, reach out if you have questions. And um, it's really great hearing about your work and very, very important as we all know. <laughs> um, so thanks for connecting with us, Eric. And um, everyone have a great rest of their day. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, interest and in energy is currency in this space. So <laughs> keep up the great work and hopefully our paths cross again. Thanks for chatting with me. Thanks, Eric. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye-bye.